Uterine fibroid embolization. So first of all, fibroids are a common benign tumor that occur in the uterus. Now why, again, why they occur there, you know, I, I don't know, but it's fairly common um, for women to have these fibroids in their uterus. And it ca these fibroids um, cause problems. They cause um, heavy menstruation, pain, and a pressure on adjacent structures, causing an obstruction. Uh, for example, I had a friend who had um, fibroids and her fibroids got so big that it caused her uh, to not be able to urinate and so she had to have emergency surgery to release that uh, pressure that the because it was causing that obstruction. So the traditional uh, cure or treatment for this is to have a hysterectomy, um, but some women are still within childbearing age and still want to have children, and so this is an alternative to hysterectomy. And so first we have to remember where the uterine artery is, and it is a branch from the internal iliac artery, so this is showing you the aorta, the common iliacs, here's external and here's internal. And then from the internal iliac is the uterine artery. Um, so what this procedure does then is um, you put uh, an embolic material, whether it be coils, uh, glue, you know, whatever the embolic material is, you put that material into the uterine artery and it uh, blocks the blood flow to these fibroids and then the fibroids eventually uh, shrink and go away because the blood flow to them has been blocked. The next pathology is um, mesenteric ischemia. So first of all, we need to remember where the mesenteric artery is. Um, in this case, we're talking about, usually we're talking about the superior mesenteric artery. For whatever reason, the inferior mesenteric artery uh, usually does not um, become blocked or occluded. Um, so we're talking about the superior mesenteric artery. That one is located just below the celiac artery and just above the renal arteries. So you need to know where that is, and we have, to, we have to know what the mesenteric artery provides blood flow to, and that is a lot of the intestine. Um, so acute mesenteric artery that can be caused uh, by a blood clot, um, again it could be from the heart, or it could be um, maybe there was a lesion within that mesenteric artery and um, it ruptured, and then a thrombus formed after that. Um, so Acute mesenteric ischemia, um, usually um, it's an emergency surgery and they have to have an aortomesenteric bypass and resection, meaning removal of any non-viable bowel. So here in this picture, here, this is the uh, celiac artery here with the trifurcation. Just below it is the superior mesenteric artery. So its origin is actually from here and then it descends down. So here is showing you a this is actually looks like a, mes a, f a femoral mesenteric bypass. And so what this does is it this graft fills retrograde. So um, when the blood gets to here, this graft fills goes back up to fill the mesenteric artery. And then there is chronic mesenteric ischemia, which, you know, that is more where it um, occurs, you know, over a time span of months to years, and so if there is a stenosis in that mesenteric artery, that can be uh, uh, treated with a, with angioplasty and a stent. A GI bleed, um, a lot of times GI bleeds are uh, treated with endoscopy, and so not treated in an interventional lab, but sometimes the endoscopy um, fails, and it's not able to be treated that way, so then they come to the interventional lab. Um, GI bleeds, the patient has blood in their um, emesis or blood in their stools, you know, whether it's an upper or lower GI bleed. Um, so we need to think about the arteries that supply um, the GI. So we've got the celiac artery for the upper GI, the superior mesenteric for the small bowel and right colon and then the inferior mesenteric artery for the sigmoid and rectum. So this picture is just showing you, um, I believe it's the celiac artery. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, I think it's the celiac artery. And here it's showing you this blush. 
so demonstrating a GI bleed. And then here, this is the after they've done an embolization on that artery, and now there is no blush, meaning there's they've occluded the, um, the artery that was bleeding. Tumors can be treated um, in the interventional lab. Um, a lot of times, um, arteriograms are done um, before and after a treatment to see, you know, um, the outcome. Also, uh, angiograms are done before and after surgery um, to, again, just to um, evaluate how things are going. Neoplasm means new growth, or another, that's a medical term for tumor. And so, again, the uh, mesenteric arteries supply uh, blood to the bowel. The celiac and superior mesenteric arteries supplies uh, blood to the pancreas, and um, those are sometimes evaluated for tumors in the bowel and pancreas. Um, a more common um, tumor is the hepatoma, and so a hepatoma is a primary tumor of the liver. Excuse me, of the liver, and um, they can use a transarterial embolization um, for that tumor. And um, not only can they cut the blood supply off to that tumor, but they also can um, use um, uh, they can use uh, chemo chemotherapeutic drugs as well. And so there's different techniques to this. Um, they can inject the chemotherapy drugs, and then inject the embolization, the embolic materials. And what that does is not only does it cut off the blood supply, but it keeps the, that chemotherapy drug trapped into that tumor. And um, so the embolic material, you know, could be a variety of things. It could be drug-eluting embolic beads coated with chemotherapy drugs, or it could, uh, or the treatment could also be a radiation or a radioactive type embolic material. So there's different ways of, of doing this. And the reason why the liver can tolerate this type of exam is because remember it has two blood supplies. It has the hepatic artery, which you know just normally supplies it with blood, and then it also has the portal vein. And we're going to talk about the portal circulation a lot more, um, but just keep in mind that that's why the liver can tolerate this type of uh, procedure, whereas other organs cannot because the liver does have that second uh, blood supply. The next pathology is about the renal arteries. And so the renal arteries, what it's important to know about your kidneys is that your kidneys have a role in regulating your blood pressure. So if there is an obstruction of one or both renal arteries, that can make you have high blood pressure. And again, um, I don't understand 100% that mechanism. I know it has to do with hormones and, and uh, water regulation and things like that. But the main thing is just to understand that concept, that if there is a obstruction of the renal artery, that that could in itself cause you to have high blood pressure. Um, so obstructive renal disease can cause you to have high blood pressure. And the, the causes of obstructive disease of the renal arteries, again, is atherosclerosis, which is accumulation of plaque, or it could be that FMD, that fibromuscular dysplasia that we talked about in an earlier uh, lesson. And again, the treatment is angioplasty um, and stent. Um, now, obstruction of that renal artery, we've already said, can cause high blood pressure. It also can cause renal failure. So we need to talk about what renal failure is just briefly. Um, first of all, the kidneys filter blood. That's its job, or one of its jobs. One of its main jobs is to filter blood. It filters out the bad, and, um, and then that bad, or waste, or filtrate, um, comes out as urine and then the clean blood um, goes back to the body's circulation. And so a obstruction of your renal artery can cause the kidneys to fail to filter. It can cause renal fail failure, which is uh, uh, where the kidneys fail to filter the blood correctly. Um, so again, those are the two outcomes of when the renal artery could, is occluded, it could cause renal failure or it ca could cause high blood pressure. Sometimes uh, renin sampling is done. So again, so of course this is done um, 
via the renal vein, so this is a venous puncture, and then they um, remove blood or sample blood from the renal vein, and what they're doing, and then they take that for lab analysis, and um, what they do is they test that blood to see the level of renin, and if one kidney has a higher level of renin than the other, then that is can be used to, to determine the cause of the high blood pressure. So let's say you have stenosis in both renal arteries. Um, if you do renin sampling of both renal veins and one has a significantly higher renin um, level, then that will be the, the one that you want to treat because that's the one that's causing the high blood pressure.